happy morning one and all it gives me immense pleasure to introduce the subject expert member the guest speaker of today's first session our academic chairperson professor gopal ayer he obtained b honors in mechanical engineering from rec trichy in 1972 from 1972 to 2012 he was an active corporate service in india and abroad between 1972 and 1985 he worked in india in multinational companies before he left india to work abroad he was the materials manager of johnson and johnson limited between 1985 and 1988 He worked in Nigeria. In December 1988, he joined an international trading company in Hamburg, Germany, as their CEO. He worked with this organization for 18 years till September 2006. During those 20 or years of working abroad in Nigeria and Germany, he had the opportunity to visit almost every nook and corner of the world. all on business in 2006 he wound up from germany and returned to settle back in motherland india and worked as a divisional head in a large company that specialized in power plant manufacturing in december 2012 he retired from active corporate service and joined saranathan college to fruitfully utilize his administrative skills he can speak read and write besides english tamil hindi bengali marathi gujarati and german he has just finished fourth and final level of sanskrit in june 2020 20 music sports and reading are his favorite hobbies he loves to interact with youngsters like you a very good morning my young friends There is a very popular and powerful proverb in English which says show me your friend and I'll show you who you are I'm taking advantage of the privileges that I get because of my age and slightly twisted this proverb and coining the title for my address to you today as follows as follows know your heritage and bring out the potential to become successful engineers you are all aiming to be budding engineers it's time you look at what a pride-filling heritage we all have inherited from our forefathers our forefathers achieved excellence virtually in almost every field but we will look at what they achieved in astronomy medicine metallurgy mathematics architecture and physics just as samples of what they could achieve traditionally in our marriages there is a ceremony called arunvali patha the newly wed bride and bridegroom are shown the stars arunvati and vasishta this is not just to show them the sky and ask them to be star bound it is a very deep astronomical philosophical idea behind it arunvati and vasishta are stars that are part of the constellation that we call saptarishi and in the western astronomy it is called the big dipper and our stars arunvati and vasishta are called alcor and mizor respectively you can see that in this slide behind it they are very close to each other but it is very difficult to find out that they are not separate it is difficult to see them in the night sky and more so in the day sky but you can perhaps see that in the enlarged version that you get here of alcor and mizra but the the distance has been deliberately extended to give you an idea apart from being the stars that can be also seen during the day time arundhati and vasishta are what they call 
binary stars. While a normal star orbits around another star, binary stars orbit around each other. So, the real message to the newlywed couple is that like Arundhati and Vasishta, they should revolve around each other and spend their marital life. Before you see the video of the two stars orbiting each other, remember this practice of seeing Arundhati during the marriages have been in existence for ages, even in times long before telescope was invented and still our forefathers were able to see that these two stars and show them to newlywed couples as models for a happy married life. This video, however, has been created based on images seen through a telescope. You can see the two stars here and they are and the next shot, of course, will show you how they revolve around each other again. This is Alcor and Mizar, or rather, actually, Alcor and Mizar. It's really surprising that without the help of a telescope, our forefathers could even specify the distance between Moon and Earth and also Earth and Sun. Rig Veda specifically mentions this and Rig Veda has been dated to be about 11,000 years old. It is known to be the oldest text on Earth and it's around 11,000 years ago. It specifies, as you see in this slide, the distance between Moon and Earth is 108 times the diameter of Moon and the distance between, uh, the, the size between Earth and the Sun is, Sun is 108 times the diameter of Earth and the distance between Earth and Sun is 108 times the diameter of the, uh, uh, the Sun there. Now, what is more interesting is, I have deliberately charted that for you, Moon to Earth is, this is what the Rig specifies approximately, the actual is this. Diameter of Earth is 8000 miles as per that calculation, but the actual is 7918 miles. Diameter of Sun is this as per the calculation of Rig Veda, and the actual is 864. The Earth to Sun distance is this as per Rig Veda and actually is about 148 million kilometers which is 91962937 miles which is no, I mean talking about the distances absolutely within acceptable variation limits. What's more important, even though Maxwell is created or credited with the distinction of having calculated the speed of light in the 19th century, Ashoka and Rig Veda specifies how long it takes for the sun to travel, sunlight to travel from the sun to earth. I have put in a simplified calculation for you. When you look at that, the specific Shoka that we are talking about is 154, which means book number one of Rig Veda. 50th time, 4th verse, and it says, it is remembered here, that sunlight traverses 2202 yojanas in half an emission. Now, yojana is approximately, all these can be calculated, but I have deliberately brought it to this statement, so that it is easier for us to look at that in the limited time we have. Yojana is approximately 9.09 .09 miles. Nimisha here is not the limit that we know, but the time taken for batting an eye lift that is equal to so many seconds, that is average calculated. The above two have been simplified here. So now we can calculate what is the value of the speed of light in modern units based on the value of given in Rigveda as 2202 yojanas 
in half a division. That's what the sloka says, in half a division. When you calculate that, it comes to 189547 miles per second, whereas actual speed is 186,000, which is within 2% variation of the actuals, which is amazing. I have made all these statements based on the fact that our forefathers did not have access to a telescope. But I am not really very sure because 800 years back, um, in the year 1608, a telescope was found. But there is a, a Hoysala temple in Halibidu where on the, in the 12th century, which is almost 400 years before the telescope was even invented, there is a sculpture which shows a woman using an instrument like a telescope. So we don't know whether the telescope was earlier available to our forefathers or not. From astronomy, we go to medicine. Modern ultrasound scanning of a fetus or a child in a womb was started somewhere around 1956. But in Tamil Nadu, about 800 years back, there is a temple built by the Chola. It is at, uh, I think, uh, the Sundara Kamakshi temple at uh, Shiri Kurumbu. Uh, Shiri Kurumbu. Yeah, where they have sculpted a, a child inside a room. Now what is surprising is even doctors are astonished at the position with which the position of the fetus, the child inside the room and the clarity with which it has been done. More importantly, knowing it is not enough. You sculpt it onto a granite stone and depict it. That has been the brilliance that we have uh, from our forefathers in terms of medicine. From medicine, we go to metallurgy. One of the most difficult metals to smelt is zinc. Why? Because the melting point of zinc is 907 degrees centigrade. Melting point means from solid to liquid. This temperature is pretty high to reach given the technological advancement of the previous years. But the bigger problem is that the boiling point of zinc, that is from liquid to gas, lies between 915 to 920 degrees. From 907 to 920, it is very quick. You just will not be able to control that at all. So you will get liquid zinc, but before you know, it will become gaseous zinc. So you will, and recovery of gaseous zinc is a very, very difficult and costly process. Actually, zinc smelters came up in the Western world in the year 1738, 18th century. But there are archaeological evidence of zinc smelting in Zawar in Rajasthan almost 4,000 years ago, 9th century before Christ was the time. In fact, there is a, a sheet of zinc that is displayed in a museum in Italy which has been carbon dated to be about 4,000 years old. And it proves that, of course, they have done the dating and the, this uh, through carbon dating to even find out the location. It was from Zawar in Rajasthan. So 4,000 years back, Indians in Rajasthan, Zawar mines, knew how to smelt zinc. How did they do it? They created a furnace in the shape of an inverted brim doll. And they called it Tirak Patna Yantra. What does Tirak Patna Yantra mean? A, a device which forces whatever is inside to travel in the reverse direction. Basically, the distillation process is in the reverse direction. Normally, in a furnace, you will heat it from the bottom and 
the whole thing will come up and then it will filter out or something but here it will have to drop to the bottom I have shown that uh, inverted the preval here the dates here are later dates but we have uh, uh, archaeological evidence that this sort of a inverted uh, brindol furnace uh, here there is a retort but in the older days they used a trough full of water so what used to happen is the zinc used to get melted the liquid zinc will fall down and it will immediately drop into the, a pot of water or a trough of water and it becomes solid again because the temperature drop is sun so it becomes pure hot zinc but one area that our ancient Indians consistently exhibited their amazing capabilities is in architecture be it the 3500 feet long corridors of Rameshwar or these temples uh, Ekambara Swami temple corridor in uh, Kanjimro the sheer precision with which the straight line pillars have been etched or sculpted is amazing but what amazes everyone is perhaps the Brahadishwara temple or big temple that is situated in Tanjavur this was built during the Rajaraja Chora period and finished in the year 1010 AD that is about 1000 years back 1000 years and 10 years back the main program is about 200 feet high it's a massive structure any civil engineer worth his salt would tell you that for such a massive and a huge structure the foundation has got to be at least 50 feet but excavations have told us uh, proved us that the foundation for this temple is only 5 feet what? 5 feet? how can it be possible? then what is holding all this massive structure together? the whole massive structure is supported at the top how? that's where the ingenuity of the Chola architecture comes to the fore look at the gopuram at the top there is a round uh, uh, structure some say it is a single piece some say it is a combination of many pieces but that weighs 80 tons beneath that is a square slab that weighs another 80 tons on top of this square slab eight nandis two each two on each side two of them are visible here two on each side so eight nandis are there each one weighs 10 tons so that is another 80 tons so we have 240 tons of weight at the top that supports the whole structure of the gopra how is that possible? it's possible because the whole gopra has been constructed in what is called the loose structure layer after layer of stones are laid with a small gap between those uh, two stones or two layers of stones as well as two adjacent stones now what happens is at the end of the structure construction you put a weight on top and the, the whole thing sits down and meshes together to form a very close unbreakable combination 